welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. So we thank you today, Lord, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, meekness. We thank you for the joy of the Lord being in the house of God. We thank you, Father, that we can approach the seriousness of who you are and what you are for us and the word of God with seriousness. But, Lord, we thank you that we get to have a light heart as we approach the word of God because you love us and we know that you love us and have our best at hand. We thank you, Father, that the teacher of the church is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all of the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and in our lives. And Lord, we are so grateful. As you bless us today, we think of and ask you to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our brothers and sisters, our Baptist brothers and sisters, and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics and Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary chapels and Harvest, and we thank you for Oak Valley and with the Well, and we thank you for the Way, and we thank you for Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist and Ecclesia Church, our Catholic brothers and sisters, Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time, Lord, no time, do we think of ourselves as better than them. We see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field. We're happy when they're happy. We're blessed when they're blessed. And we give you the praise and glory for honoring your churches everywhere with your presence. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all said, Amen. Amen. Man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. This, I know you've been waiting. It's been a lot of months since we've, we've had a phenomenal time Freedom for Our Future campaign. By the way, I'll tell you more about it in a little while, but you can pick up an introductory package if you don't know what Freedom for Our Future is all about. Gives you the CDs, gives you the information outside at the uh, information counter, information table. And uh, we just want you to know we need you to get involved. It's pretty good. In case you didn't know this, I just thought I might mention this to all of you. Last week we spent, uh, spent, we sent Five over 500, over a half a million dollars to the mortgage company reducing our mortgage by a half a million dollars last week. That is pretty cool. You guys did good. What we say we're going to do after 25 years, we will do. And so what we need you to do is get involved. This is not a game. I mean, we just sent up a half a million dollars just last week, and we're going to get this completely reduced. So get involved and get involved and get involved and then get involved some more, and then we'll get it done. It's great. We have about $9,300,000 in pledges towards our $13 million goal, so we're pretty much over 70%. I think you guys ought to give yourselves a hand. Isn't that cool? Okay, now wait a minute. And those of you that are online all over the world, zero in on me. <laughs> we'll get involved too. You don't have to sit back there in whatever country you're in and say, I really like the Rock Church and not invest in the Rock Church. You need to invest in the Rock Church. We're waiting for you to get involved. So get involved in the Rock Church. Push the green button. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! All right, listen, uh, I'm going to get into the word of the Lord today, and we're going to get our Bibles out, and I want you to hear something you haven't heard in a long time. Turn to Hebrews. <laughs> it's been months since we've been in Hebrew. It's going back to it. For those of you who don't understand this, we teach line upon line, precept upon precept. The word of God says it, that settles it. I love it. Billy Graham said that. The Word of God settles it. That's the way it is, man. And so we're looking at the Word of God. What it says, it says a lot to each and every one of us. In order for us to pick up, and we would be picking up in a very difficult spot in the text of Hebrews, understanding that, 
In order for us to do that, we're going to rewind your thinking. Those of you that are brand new, you can hook right on today's message. and It'll be great. So we're going to rewind your thinking just a little bit. We're going to go actually all the way back to the fifth chapter, verse number 12. Let me just give you some information. Here we find the writer of Hebrews. Can I tell you something? Let's, let's be honest with each other. I don't give a flip who the writer of Hebrews is. I know the ultimate writer. His name is Jesus. He's the living word of God. Now watch this. It's all the inspiration of God. It's not the inspiration of a man. This is not about... So the writer of Hebrews is making a statement. And as he makes this statement, it's been preserved for thousands of years for you and I to look into so that we can find out what the word of God has to say. Wow. In other words, at the lives of people, can you imagine this? Thousands of people have died preserving the word of God so you could have it on your lap right now. And here we'd sometimes take it so as if it's unimportant and God doesn't want you to do that. Today, let's make it very important to look at the word of God and find out the truth. We look at the word and as we see the word of God, great things are going to be brought forth to our hearts. The writer of Hebrews is like angry at this group of people that he's writing to. It's almost like he's beating on the table as he's writing this. It's under the inspiration. He's just frustrated as he could possibly be. And he's making a statement. He's making a statement to these people. But you and I are the recipients of the wisdom of those people. We learn how to live our life by what they did and didn't do. So the story that he's talking about is really not about them. It's about you and about me. Do you get that? And as we look at the word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, we can't just jump around. We have to cover everything, every little detail as we go through the word of God. And so we're looking at the lives of these people, what for? To find out how to live our lives today. I don't know about you, but I want to be pleasing to God. I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed. I want to have answered prayers. I want the windows of heaven to open up and pour out a blessing on me and my family. I want God to do great, mighty, marvelous things. I do not want God just to overlook me. I want God to see me as something that he can trust and someone he can do great things with. And you want that yourself. And don't tell me you don't. But in order to get that operating in your life, you're going to have to see what takes place in the Word of God. So here's the writer, and he's frustrated with these people. He's like beating on the desk, and here's the reason why that. He's doing it. Because they stayed babies when they could have become mature. Let me say it again. They stayed babies when they could have become mature. Let me say it like this. It is the goal of God, listen to this, to get you and I to a place of maturity. God does not want you to stay a child when he wants you to grow up. And that's why the title of this message is Become Healthy, Strong, and Mature. If you have a loving pastor, he'll care about three areas of your life. Becoming healthy, strong, and mature. And that's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for your children. That's what God wants for your future. That's what God wants for your life. And that's, if you will, what God wants for each and every one of us. Becoming healthy, strong, and mature. As we look at the word of the Lord, let's check it out for ourselves and see what the word of God says. Hebrews 5th chapter. Hebrews 5th chapter, verse number 12, makes a very clear statement. Hebrews 5th chapter, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers. In other words, he's scolding them. At this time, you ought to be teachers. In fact, you have need of someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. In other words, you already heard the basics. And now you're wanting people to give you the basics again and again and again. And he makes it very clear. He says, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Can I ask you a question? In the, in the uh, health of a person, a human being, in the, in the growth of a human being, which type of a person needs milk and which type of a person eats solid food? Now let's think about that just for a moment because I want you to answer the question. In your knowledge, what kind of a person can only handle 
milk. A what? A, let's say it again. What kind of a person can handle milk is what? A baby. And solid food belongs to the older people. Is that right? So he uses this illustration. He says, you have come to need milk and not solid food. Verse number 13 comes along fastly in verse. Are you listening? You got to get this. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness as a baby. Now he describes them as a baby. But he also says what makes them a baby. They're unskilled. They're unskilled, notice what it says, in the word of righteousness. Didn't say they were unskilled in their thinking. Didn't say they were unskilled in their looks. Didn't say they were unskilled in their abilities. Didn't say they were unskilled in their education. Didn't say they're unskilled in their political views. Didn't say any of that. Unskilled in the word of righteousness. Now I want you to stop. I'm going to stop for a moment. I want you to concentrate. Look back up here at me. There are two types of maturity. There's the maturity of a human being that's judged by how old we are and whether or not we have gray hair and how long we have been around. That's maturity. That's the natural way of viewing maturity. But God's view of maturity is different. So if we're thinking it's about how long you've been around, how much you know, whether or not you can make decisions, whether or not you can process the data that's coming at you and come up with conclusions that gives you directions in life, that is the wrong evaluation. God's evaluation of maturity is he that can handle, listen to these words, the word of righteousness determines whether or not someone is mature. Mature to God is not an age. Mature to God is not a look. Mature to God is how well you take the word of God and apply it in your life. If I'm sick, I use the word of God. If my marriage isn't doing well, I use the word of God. If I'm not doing well, I use the word of God. But if I don't use the word of God, I become unskilled. And the Bible calls this in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, it's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So if I can use the sword of the spirit of the word of God in my everyday life, then I am considered by God to be a mature person. And that's something you and I need to see. If I am unskilled in the word of righteousness, the word of God, then guess what? The Bible makes it very clear that I'm still a baby only living my life on milk. Now, wait a minute. If I had a 16-year-old son... And he said to me, Dad, I, 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 I'm 16 now. I, I want you to give me the keys to your car and let me go driving. But he had a mind of 11-year-old. Would I give him the keys to the car and let him go? No, and it's exactly the same thing with God. And if we're not mature in the what, what makes mature to God? Not your age, not how long you've been around, not how many degrees you have, not whether you've gone to seminary or didn't go to seminary, not whether you've got initials behind your name or don't have behind your name. That's not what's mature to God. What's mature to God is how well you handle the word of the Lord. When a problem comes, do you look at the word and say, listen, uh, all things work together for the good of the Lord and called according to first. When I'm sick, I'm healed by the stripes of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then when the demon and pressure comes upon you, do you make a statement that says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me? Or do you allow the pressures to tear you apart, take you down? Because a baby lets it happen, but a mature person deals with it with the word of God. Verse 14. But solid food, here we get into the solid food. But solid food belongs to those that are full age. The word full age, circle it in your Bible. It means mature. Solid food belongs to those that are mature. That is those by, notice the word I highlighted, the word reason. Did you know that every decision and every direction you get is because of reasoning? In other words, you have human calculations on how you're going to do things, and that's what the word reasoning means. For every one of us in here, before you make a decision, you reason what you're going to do. Like for an example, if you were going to leave today and go down to the beach, what you would do is you would literally Say to yourself, well, I'm going to leave here. I'm going to dress here. I'm going to get changed. I'm going to get on the 10 free. I'm going to get in the 91. I'll take the 55 down, get off down there, and I'll find a parking place down there. Hopefully, some people will be leaving when I get there. And you will have reasoned 
on what you're going to do. That's what the word reasoning means. Mental capacity to function. Now, he's talking about mature people. Saw the food below those food. Below. That is, those by reason of use have their senses exercised. In other words, you're full of senses, my friend. You know, touching, healing, smelling, tasting, all the senses, seeing the senses that you have. But those senses can be sensitive towards the things of the world or sensitive towards those things of God. They can be extremely sensitive towards the flesh and also extremely sensitive towards the things of God. But we have to exercise our senses towards that which is the word of righteousness. So he says, by reason, mental capacity of use, have their senses exercised. In other words, I can now discern something through my senses. I can now see something. I can feel something. I can touch what's, no, what's good and what's evil. You see the word good up there? None good but God, Jesus says. So when you see the word good, when God says good, it's not your kind of good. It's not politicians good. It's not the political system that's good. It's not what society or social systems or the moral majority says is good. What's good is what God says. You got to get that inside of your thinking. The world today calls that which is good bad and that which is bad good. Are you following me? The only one, not the Supreme Court, but the only one who can determine what is good is God. And you got to get settled on that issue. Now, so the verse comes along and talks about who's mature. A mature person has their senses so sensitive that they can discern that which is of God and that which is evil. See the word evil? The word evil means anything that's contrary to the ways of God. Now, wait a minute. Let me say that again. Did you get that? Anything that's contrary to the ways of God. One more time. Anything that's contrary to the ways of God. It doesn't mean I don't care if every person in America votes for something that's contrary to the way of God and they call it good. God still calls it bad. It's just the way it is. And see that, I mean, the bottom line, whether you like that or not, if you're a Christian, you've got to go along with what God says, not what the world says. Are you following me? I don't give a flip what politicians say. I don't care what the economists say. I don't give a darn about what the, the, the uh, ecologists say. I care about what God says. And I come to a place where my senses are sensitive to discern or to determine what is of God and what isn't of God. That's a mature person. See verse 14? Now in your Bible, go with me if you will, into Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse 15. What? No, just turn to the fifth chapter, verse 15. Come on, smarty pants. Get to verse 15. Why aren't you having a problem with verse 15? Huh? Well, if you carried your Bible you would know that there is no verse 15. Verse 15 is the sixth chapter, verse one. That's verse 15. Are you following me? I mean, you all know so much about the things of God and you sit there and judge me all the time and you don't even have a Bible in your lap. Are, are we okay with each other? Can I speak frankly? Okay, so you're sitting there saying, okay, let's go to verse 15. There's no verse 15, it's chapter six, verse one. And it all runs at one thing, and that's the way it is. And verse 1 says it like this. Therefore, see the first word up there, therefore. Therefore is because of what I just said. You were babies and should have grown up by now, but you didn't. You didn't have your senses discerning what is good and of God. You didn't live by the word of God. You lived by your own ideas and philosophies and ideologies, and now you're still needing milk instead of going on. See, the goal for every one of us is to get to a place of, mer uh, uh, of maturity. Now he comes along and he makes a statement. First word, therefore, in other words, because of what I just said in chapter number five, here's chapter number six. Leaving, I love leaving. You can't leave something unless you're in something. I'm going to leave this building, but I'm out in the courtyard. You can't leave the building until you get in the building and leave the building. So when he makes a statement leaving, that means somebody has to be in something to get out of something. And he says leaving the discussion and the elementary principles of Christ. He's not saying that the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ are bad. 
But once you know them, move on into maturity. Don't camp there. And what we do oftentimes, we learn a little truth as Christians, and we camp in that truth. And we stay there, and we never go to where God wants us to be, never growing to the place of getting the solid food. Are you following me? And we stay the 11-year-old wanting to drive instead of being the 16-year-old that gets the car. Is anybody, is anybody, anybody getting this? He says, leaving those elementary principles of Christ, not that they're bad, nobody's saying they're bad, but there's a time when you know these basic things move on into a place of perfection. You see the word perfection up there? The word perfection means maturity. He's right back to maturity. It is the very goal of God for everybody that's born of the Spirit of God to become mature in God. That's what he's wanting. Not, I didn't write this. Not lying again. In other words, you already had it once. Why would you do it again? In other words, you put one foundation down, you can put another foundation down on top of that other foundation. It's time to start building on the foundation. He says, not lying again, the foundation of repentance towards dead works. Now, he gives us five things. Repentance towards dead works. In other words, get out of yourself and start doing God. You don't need to camp around that. Have you ever been in church and some churches camp around that? That's all there ever is. Man, is you need to turn away from your sin. You're just a sinner. Get into God. Man, once you've been a, uh, washed by the blood and you're no longer in a sinning position, it's time to move on. But there are churches that camp around that. And then I love this one. Listen, line to get uh, repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. There's places all the time, all they talk about, faith towards God. Faith, 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 faith. Do you know there's other things in the Bible that, 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 uh, that are not faith? I mean, it's shocking that God would ever speak about love. You'd think it was just about faith. It's shocking to talk about mercy or grace. Talk shocking. Wait a minute. There's a whole lot shocking how God wants to do a lot of things. But a lot of times you go into church, man, they have camped about one thing. It's time. That's a great thing. That's not saying it's bad. It's a great thing. But let's get it and move on. And he comes along the next verse, verse number two, and he makes this statement. The doctrine of baptisms. You ever been in a church that talked about baptism? Either water baptism. Man, you've got to be water baptized. Water baptized. All about water baptism. All about you're never going to get to heaven unless you get water baptized. Let me tell you something. I believe in water baptism. We do them all the time out here. But let's don't camp there. There's other things besides that one principle. How about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You ever been in a church that's just full of Pentecostalism? It's just all Pentecostal, man. Speaking in tongues, uh, prophecy. You think that was the ultimate. It's not the ultimate. Ultimate is get it, operate in it. That's great. Get those gifts operated of the Holy Spirit that's inside you. Move past into what? The righteous word of God and learn how to apply it to be mature. Yeah. How about the resurrection for the dead? A lot of times you go, so we always talk about heaven, always talk about, how about eternal judgment, always what's going to happen to heaven. You're building these camps around these things. They're great. But then the next verse, verse number three comes along. And this is where we left off last time. So this is a brief review. Is that okay? Verse number three, and this we will do. Biggest little word in the Bible, if God permits. If you get out of being an 11-year-old, you can drive as a 16-year-old because you grew up. And that's what this is all about. If God permits. If God, in other words, God knows what's good for you. And if he gives you something that's not good for you, like you would give your kid the car, even though he wants it, and even though he's old enough for it, but he's not mature enough for it, the car would destroy him and other people. So God looks at where you're at to see whether or not he's going to move you into a place. How do you get to the place where you need to be? Simply as this. Listen closely. I love this. Whether or not you're applying and using the word of righteousness in every situation in your life. And can I tell you something? I don't do that. I don't do that. But I'm learning how to do that. Are you following me? There are times when my flesh rises up and I act like a baby. Is that surprising to you? But then the word of God gets big and bigger than my flesh and I get rid of the action of the flesh and I do the word of God and I get out of being a baby and become mature. And that's where all of us are at in order to be mature. We're learning how to do these things. Is anybody listening today? So the point here that's so great is the goal for each and every one of us is maturity. 
What does God want? Once you're saved, headed for heaven, he wants you mature so he can use you and bless you on this planet to a lost and dying world. Number two, as we look at the next section of words and as they're written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they open up a new evaluation of understanding that I might just pre-warn you may bug you. Is that okay? But can I just tell you something? Listen to me closely. I love you enough to tell you the truth. And I'm old enough not to care whether you like it or not, but I do care. I do care. I don't want to offend you. And I don't want to hurt you. But these next three verses are so powerful, they actually change the thinking and should of the American church. I didn't write it. God wrote it. But if you properly evaluate the word of God, it ought to cause you two things. It ought to cause you to have a greater trust in God and a greater fight of faith. That's one. And then secondly, a greater reverence in who God is. God is not someone to mess with. God is not someone you take lightly. God is not someone you don't treat seriously. And as we look at these words, I want you to see them and see them from the heart of God that cares about you. Because they say so much about you. Are you ready? Here it is. Verse number four. Verse number four. For it is impossible. Let me read through verse four, five, six. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened in the face of the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Verse number five. Listen to this. And have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come. Verse number six. Listen to this. And if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they have crucified again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. You say, what in the world does that all mean? All of a sudden he comes out of it. We're being mature to a place. He says, if you're going to walk away from where you're at, you are making the worst mistake of your life. Now here's how it goes. Let's take a look at it. Go back with me to verse number four and let's take a look. For it is impossible. Now what's impossible? It's impossible to renew again those that have walked away from where they're at with God. But you can't just walk away because you're stupid and not be renewed. You can't walk away and not be renewed because you're, you know, childish. Because there's every one of us that are in here from time to time that when we were young in the things of God have raised our hands to God. Our prayers didn't get answered. What are you doing, God? Where are you? Put the cards down. My life is falling apart. I'm not sure I'm going to believe in you. I'm not even sure you're even up there. He's not talking about that kind of an experience, even though most of us have had those kind of experiences. Because God looks at that experience and says, they were just too stupid to know what they were talking about. He's talking about someone who has really been in God, who walked away from God. Let me tell you this. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. No one can take you out of the hands of God, but you can take yourself out of the hands of God. God has never made robots and called them you. If you wanted to make a robot to act a certain way, to walk a certain way, to talk a certain way, he gave you a free will choice. And who God wants is those that free by free will who make a choice for God, not a robot that acts a certain way. And that's what's called being born again, is that you're making a free will choice to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. And not a robot. God could have made robots. Now let me ask you a question. Now here we find a situation taking place. Those that are in the things of God can walk away. Wait a minute, Pastor. What are you talking about? I heard once saved, always saved. And I heard that anybody that does walk away, they were really not saved in the first place. Uh-huh. Let's see if that's true by using the scripture. Let me tell you how I view this. 70 years ago, we found that the church made a massive change in order to keep people in the church. They came up with a doctrine that was literally wrong and watered down the truth of the word of God. It was the once saved, always saved doctrine. 
In other words, doesn't matter whether people served God or not. Doesn't matter whether they were good or not. Doesn't matter what they did or didn't do because it didn't really care. They're going to all go to heaven and go to heaven. Once they're saved, they'll go to heaven. They can be saved and act like idiots for the rest of their life and still go to heaven. My problem with that has always been if God didn't let Lucifer stay in heaven and he just wanted to be like God, is he going to let a lot of rebels who don't care about him into heaven and spent their entire life never serving God? Wait a minute. I'm not saying one way or the other because I'm not God and I'm not judging and I don't know how far his mercy goes and I don't neither do you how far his grace goes. But let's evaluate the word of God. Is that okay? For yourself, let's look at it. Now, here's the rub. Here's what rubs you the wrong way and here's what, you know, be prepared for this, Here's what you will not like. You will start thinking of relatives who were half in and half out that maybe were a little bit in and almost all the way out and someone told you they're in heaven. I want you to know something. I don't know if they are or not because I'm not God and I'm not trying to tell you they are or aren't. But I'll tell you what I do think. Most likely they're not according to these scriptures. Listen to these words. Really powerful. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened. So someone comes along and says, well, they were never really saved. That's why they left. Oh, wait a minute. Once enlightened? Since when are you transformed out of the kingdom of darkness into the light of his dear son? Let me ask you this. Is it not Jesus who says that you are the light of the world? When you are enlightened, according to Ephesians, the first chapter, the light on this planet, you are enlightened when you got saved to the reality of salvation. You don't get enlightened when you're uh, uh, still in the world. You don't get enlightened when you're not saved. These are talking about people who are saved. Let's see if, we, if, if it continues. He says, and have tasted. So he says, not only just enlightened, but he's really going to support what he's saying. Have tasted the heavenly gift. Have you ever thought about what the heavenly gift is? The heavenly gift is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Can I just say something to you? You don't get to have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. That's what tasting means. And you don't have Jesus on the inside of you unless you're saved. You don't get the taste and the Holy Spirit on the inside of you when you're a sinner. You only get them after you're saved. Are you following me? Jesus didn't send the Holy Spirit back for anybody but the people that were saved. He was the comforter for us. Therefore, there's two recognitions of what he's talking about and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Again, you don't become a partaker, a partner with the Holy Spirit as a sinner. It doesn't work that way. In other words, when you're saved, you now become a partaker of the Holy Spirit. Verse number five, he goes on. He's given us lots of illustrations to prove to us. He's talking about people who are saved, who decided to walk away from their salvation. And have tasted the good word of God. You know what the word of God has to say. And then the power of the age to come. And then he says these words. He makes it very clear. If they fall away. Wait a minute. If they fall away. If they, listen. If I was to fall off of this platform. I have to be on the platform. To fall off the platform. I can't be on the floor and fall off the platform. When he makes this statement, if they fall away, they had to be in something in order to fall away from something. That's why God says numerous times in the scripture, if you endure to the end, you shall be saved. What if you don't endure? What if you don't endure? I'm not answering that. You answer it. What if you don't endure? I'm not coming along and making a statement to you. Just you answer it. You're smart. Listen to this. He says numerous times, if you endure to the end, you shall be saved. What if you don't endure? And he comes along and says renewed again. He says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Why? Because there's not a Christ going to the cross for them again. And he already went to the cross for them one time. He's not going a second time, third time, fourth time. Now listen, as a mature Christian, you don't do that. 
But you can be a Christian and walk away from God. And the more mature you are, the more you will handle the battle with the Word of God instead of getting discouraged with God and walk away from God. Is anybody listening? And that's what he's talking about. A lot of times we don't understand this. Now, here's the deal. That tells me my relationship with God better be up and up. This is not just some cheap relationship that I could just throw against the wall of, you know, like whatever, God. That tells me I better reverence God a lot. That also tells me about this once saved, always saved stuff that goes around. That's fine, but is it true? I don't believe it is. Numerous scriptures and say it isn't. But yet, oftentimes we'll hear what anybody says and do what they say instead of what the Word of God has to say. So a number of things we've learned already. It's kind of fun. Can I just take you real quick? If you're a mature Christian, you're going to produce great things in your life. The 16-year-old drives a car. The 11-year-old gets bypassed. What you produce shows who you are. Listen to what I'm going to say to you again. What you, Jesus said it like this. You will know them by their fruit. What you produce says who you are. It says where you're going and what you're going to be doing. You speak for yourself about what your future's like based on what you produce, whether you're mature, producing good stuff, or immature, producing garbage. Because the next verse after this, verse number, if you will, seven, and verse number eight is wild. If you ever come along reading, all of a sudden, you got down, you got the thought down, and you know what's going on, you know what he's saying. Wow, it's easy to figure out, and then all of a sudden, bang, here comes this crazy verse out of the blue. When you get crazy verses that say something, but you don't know what it's saying, that's when you stop and meditate with God and find out what it's saying. Because here's verse 7. Watch this. You tell me how it fits with everything. Other than the fact that when you're mature, you produce good things. When you're immature, man, guess what? You'll produce junk. For the earth, which drinks in the rain, and don't you know it does, that often comes upon it, don't you know it does, watch this, and bears herbs. Herbs is a good thing in the Bible, valuable thing in the Bible. The bears herbs, useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. Those, here's how it is. The earth is, anybody that wants to do this is the earth. And you were all going to get the rain. And what you do with the rain, whether you cultivate the herbs or don't cultivate the herbs, take it and use it or don't is your call. Because the next verse comes on, listen to this, blessings from God. But verse 8 says, but if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected near to being cursed. Not cursed because God loves you. But those end will be burned. In other words, all the stuff you produce. Your life as a mature Christian produces godly things that brings you to a place where you get dad's car. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Are you listening to me at all? Did you get that? Are you just saying, oh, what the heck did he mean? Maybe I better rewind the whole thing. Well, that's why we have CDs. So, listen, what you produce shows who you are. And if you're producing garbage, all that garbage, 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter is going to be burned because the fire of God's going to hit it. But if you're producing gold, silver, precious stones, 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter, fire hits it, stays there, keeps on going. It's eternal. All because someone decides to become mature. Here are the things that we learned today. Really powerful things. Number one, our goal should be maturity. Number two, here's what we learned. Take God real serious. Don't mess with God. It's not worth messing with God. The Bible says in the last days there'll be a great falling away. 
Is that going to be you? Number three, once saved, always saved. Listen, nobody can take me out of salvation except myself. I can walk out. Number four, we are known by our fruit. What are you going to produce in your life? You have the ability to produce great things that are blessed by God are the ability to destroy everything around you. It's your call. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you got God brought you here for a reason. God didn't just bring you here to listen to me. This is a divine appointment you have with God. You have a lot of appointments in your life, the doctors and attorneys and plumbers and painters. This is a divine appointment you have with God. God brought you here for this reason. You know why? This is your day of salvation. Let me ask you this question. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Do you think just because you're cute or smart, talented or gifted, because you're born in America, because your mom and dad are maybe Christians, that you get to go to heaven? No, I don't think so. Because you belong to some denomination? <laughs> You've got to be kidding. You're not going to make it. Maybe your dad and mom took you to catechism class or Sabbath school class or Sunday school class. You've always thought of yourself as a Christian. Could you show me somewhere in the Bible that says you can think your way into heaven? Whoever's the most positive thinker gets to go there. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. The only way you're going to get to heaven is his way. Jesus says it like this. Here's his way. You must be born again. You must be born again. Again, most people, when I use the words born again, don't understand what it means. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Argue with him. But it's not what movies portray. It's not what Hollywood magazines and books portray. Some idiot that's a religious fanatic. That's not what he's talking about. Born again means this. Here's what it means simply from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what it means. You've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. All or nothing. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We've watered that down. It's an all or nothing relationship, and I'll prove it to you by the scripture itself. The last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, you've heard of that. Jesus himself is speaking. And he says, I'm coming again, and you know he is. And he says, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Wow, what a cold and blunt and hard and harsh statement. I'll vomit you from my mouth? Jesus said that? Yep, he did. And he means it, too. What that means is he comes back and he finds a lukewarm group of people that call themselves Christians and want to go to heaven, but they're not going to make it. So let's define for you what lukewarm is. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out. Little up, a little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God, you know, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. He's just something, like everything else is something. He's just one of the somethings in your life. Bottom line, you're not going to make it. And someone needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. And the only way you can make it is you. You, you, you. You have got to give God all of your heart because that's what it's about and all of your life. He won't steal your heart from you. He's not a thief. He's not a conniver to talk you out of your life. He's not a manipulator to make you do this. He's not floating around in some cosmic cloud with a two-by-four to hit you in the head, make you do it. He could do that, by the way, but he doesn't. He gives you the free will choice to give God all of your heart 
and give God all of your life. Now let's talk. I already know you know who God is in your head. I already know you celebrate Easter and Christmas every year of your life, but you haven't given God all of your heart. You haven't given God all of your life. You've sung the songs at Easter. You've sung the songs at Christmas. You know about the baby in the manger, but it's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. It's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. You can have head knowledge about who Jesus is and think you're going to go to heaven, die and go to hell. Because it's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done in your heart. Even the devil knows who Jesus is. He's not going to heaven. Even the fallen angels know who he is and tremble at his presence, but they're not going to heaven. Now today, you've got to make the choice yourself to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. We're in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed. We've heard the word of God. We've had a good time. Man, you received a serious word today. Serious stuff, man. And you got serious in your walk with things of God. But some of you haven't done the basics. And that's to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. You can't skip to third base without hitting first and second. First base for you is to give God all of your heart. Today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count to three because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. Back in the family, rooms, all across the auditorium. Your hand goes up all over this place, in the foyer by television. Even those of you that are online, God's watching you right where you're at. Today, you can give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Today is your day of salvation. That's why God brought you here. You can sit there and say, well, I care too much about what people think. I can't raise my hand. You know, I'll be embarrassed, Pastor, if I raise my hand. Can I tell you? Yep, you will be. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe place like this, isn't it? Than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. No one's that stupid. Don't do that. Today is your day of salvation. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Nine. Thank you. Back over here. Ten. Thank you. Up on top. Eleven. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's twelve. There's thirteen. God bless you. Anybody else? There's thirteen wise people. There's fourteen. Good call, man. Anybody else? There's fourteen smart people in this place that know they need to get right with God and do it. There's fourteen of you. Anybody else back in this family room? Anybody else? I'll cross this auditorium. You don't want to miss this. If you're sitting here saying to yourself, I wonder if I should, you should. There's 14, where are you, 15? You know you need to get your hand up and you're just resisting this so much and you know you need to. Anybody else, real quick, give God all of your heart. Give God all of your life. There's 14 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 15, God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All 15 of you, if you raised your hand, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Listen to me. No one leaves during this period of time. All 15 of you and anybody that should have raised their hand, but you didn't, but you know you should have, you can come too. Just check with your neighbor and say, come on, I'll go with you. If you need to go, I'll go with you. I want every one of you 15 and everybody else that should have. Get in the aisle, bring your stuff, meet me right here in front. We need to pray and invite Jesus in. Let's stand and welcome the people as they come. You come right now. Come on, come, 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 come. My life to you, my heart to you. Come on, you come too. Come on. To come and make me I give my life. Well, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. My heart. You're all I need to come and make me new. I give my life to you, my heart. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. They're coming from the foyer. Come on. I need to come and make me new. I give my life.
Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Well, thank God you guys have come put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. See this guy over here waving at you to your left? His name is Pastor Joel. Really good guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. Here's what he's going to do. Lead you in a prayer, give you some free stuff to take home and read, and then he's going to tell you about a program we have that will help you get strong in Jesus. Why? Because we want you mature. That's your goal. Let us help you get there. We'll fight for you. We'll pray with you. We'll meet you before church service. We're there for you to build you strong so that you serve the Lord all the days of your life. What could be wrong with serving the Lord all the days of your life? It's a good thing. And you've come to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. Make a left turn. Follow Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.